comes from the good news of Matthew, according to Matthew, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We begin in chapter 3, verse 13, and continue through chapter 4, verse 11. Hear the word of the Lord for us today. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so for now, for it is proper for us to, for in this way, uh, to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted forty days and forty nights, and afterwards he was finished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him again, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Word of God for us, the people of God, this morning. Amen. Thanks be to God. God. Thanks be to God. In baptism, in this baptism of Jesus Christ, Jesus by the Father was clearly identified as His very own Son. A beloved Son, a Son loved by the Father. He received His claim of God upon His life. As all of us in baptism, Jesus being our representative, receiving baptism as the representative of humanity for us, as he would die for the sins of the whole world, we too see a claim of God upon our life in holy baptism. God tells us who we really are and who we were created to be through the waters of of baptism and through the giving and the anointing of His Holy Spirit, we receive a new name, the name of the redeemed, the name of child of God, son or daughter of God. And baptism is first and foremost and always about what God is doing for us and in us and wants to do through us. Baptism is always about God and what God is doing for us first. That's why the great reformers such as Martin Luther, the reformers of the church, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and others saw infant baptism as a wonderful and a beautiful sign of God's prevenient grace. The grace of God, you good Methodists have heard that term prevenient before. The grace of God that goes before anything we ever do. The grace of God that even goes before us, even before we're ever born. God claims us. He sees us and He knows us and He wants us. That's the grace of God. God's claim upon our lives 
and his identity that he puts upon us before we ever do anything. God first loved us. Before we ever even had God on our radar screen, God had us on His. And in response, when we feel and experience and recognize that love of God and begin to see God as one who wants us in relationship with Him, we respond to that love of God. And I don't care who we are or what we're going to do in life. When we have this experience of God making a claim upon us and on our lives, whether it be as an adult or as an infant, when we make a commitment especially to the Lord, whether it be in the waters of baptism or after that in a reaffirmation or a confirmation, of our faith, or whether it just be with a simple uh, New Year's resolution, if you will, it's still kind of early in the New Year. Some of us have made New Year's resolutions, and others of us who uh, say we haven't made New Year's resolutions, uh, we, we have, we just call them something else probably. We all have something, at least you have something in your heart and in your mind that you have wished at least that you would like to see happen. But any time we make a commitment or when God makes a claim on our lives and when God begins to define for us who we really are, and He's the one who knows, by the way, because He created us. He knows who we are and who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to live. As we see in the story, it's by no accident, sisters and brothers. It's no accident. Jesus, immediately after Coming up out of the waters, the story tells us he was driven out into the wilderness. He was driven out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. And the devil came to him with a simple two-letter little word, if. <coughs> if. If you be the Son of God, questioning and already challenging the identity that God had placed upon his life. If you be the Son of God then you use this power in this way. Another way to look at this word if, though, is this word if can also be translated since. Since you are the Son of God, then this is how you should live. The message here is that the devil, the tempter, the evil one, Satan, comes to us and tries to redefine for us what it means for us to be a child or a son or a daughter of God. He tries to give us a new definition to live into, a new narrative, if you will, a new story, if you will. Still calling it the old, old story, the wonderful story of the people of God, but redefining it for us. It's no accident that these stories go back to back in each of the Gospels, except Luke puts a genealogy in between but it's still an identifying marker of who Jesus Christ was. A challenge to his identity and a redefinition of what it meant for him to be the Son of God. If or since you're the Son of God, then use this power that you supposedly have for your own ends and for your own benefits to do whatever it is you want to do with it. Tempting him to use this power for self. Tempting him with all of the kingdoms of the world, even. And the same is going to be true in the lives of anyone who begins to make a commitment to God. Anyone on whom God has made a claim, the temptation will be there. The temptation will come. The redefinitions will come. And Satan, as we see in this story, even loves to use Scripture out of context, of course. Misproperly interpreted. And we have to be aware. We have to know, as believers, that there is a competition, a struggle into which we are baptized. But we are baptized to win. We are baptized to win. And that's the good news this morning. As we, as a church this morning, commit 
And we're going to make some vows this morning. And I want you, sisters and brothers, to take these vows very, very seriously this morning. Don't take them lightly. If you need to, go ahead and open up your baptismal covenant in your hymnal and read through them. And if you are not serious about them, don't say it. But they're serious. We're going to respond to God's grace and, and commit this morning to this beautiful little baby girl. We're going to commit to do all that we can for God to work through us by His grace, to bless her, to form her, and to shape her into being the person that God has called her to be, the person indeed that she was created to be, to be a member and a citizen of heaven, a part of the kingdom of God and not part of the kingdoms of this world. And we talked about the difference between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God on a couple of different occasions, but it's worth repeating 